I love it. Go rock them, Steve, and so on. Anyway, y'all, I'm so thankful for that. Um, what a blessing. Um, y'all, I will never forget um, moments in my life, works of God in my life. Um, if you're a guest, our, our faith family, they know my testimony well. I share it all the time, but I just celebrated 21 years of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, I gave my life to Christ July the 24, 2002, and uh, I've, I've never been the same. I just tell you that, like the Lord has transformed my life. I'm imperfect. I make mistakes. Um, I still struggle um, with the old me at times, but I praise the Lord that, man, he doesn't look at me as a sinner anymore. He looks at me as a saint, and I'm thankful for that. And the Lord just began to do a work 21 years old. Um, in my life, and I'll never forget, though, just my journey. Uh, my journey from 21 to 24, I met with a guy this week, and this is how the Lord uses these moments. And, you know, we, we kind of um, began teaching us together, me, just looking at it from the standpoint, is whenever you see somebody, um, you know there's a need there, you stop, and you just spend time with them. And so I had this guy that showed up to change a window out in my vehicle from hail and rocks and everything else that Kapai County wants to give it. And, um, and so he showed up and he began to talk to me and ask me questions. And he asked me this question. He said, he said can I ask you this? How did, the, how did you know that the Lord was calling you into ministry? And I just began to talk to him. And I said, man, let me just tell you my story. Well, my story is from 21 to 24, I knew I was a believer. I was going deeper, but I really didn't have anybody to disciple me during those moments. And so what happened is, is as 21 to 24, I, I just kind of continued to do what I saw done, what I witnessed done, what was uh, modeled to me by others. And, and you know, I'm just going to tell you, it wasn't all bad, but it wasn't all good. I still find myself kind of going through the motions, checklisting everything. But I'll never forget this, just as I began after a season to go deeper. I said, man, I've got to go deeper. There's more to it than this. And I began to make Jesus truly the primacy of my life. Christy and I had the opportunity to get away. It was September 2013. I still remember it like it was yesterday. We were at a conference called Timothy Barnabas Conference. And the pastor that was leading the conference, he made this comment. He said, Pastor... If you're not preaching on overflow, you're not preaching. And I've shared this story several times here. And, and it may not have meant anything for anybody else, but in that moment, the Holy Spirit of God just convicted me greatly. And here's why. Because I was a bivocational pastor. I was preaching three to four times on Sunday. I mean, I was, I was scattered thin. Let me just say it that way. And so I always study to prepare for Sunday. And so I would look at a passage of scripture and I would begin to study it in preparing for Sunday. And that's not all bad, but it's not good either. What do you mean by that? Well, I was preparing to give a sermon or preach a sermon on Sunday and I was not allowing just day by day by day walking with the Lord to prepare me to preach the sermon that I was trying to plan Man, thinking and believing it was the Lord giving it to me, and I believe that moments he was. And I just say this, y'all, I have read sermons that I preached. Fellas, y'all need to listen to this. I have read through sermons that I preached 10 years ago, and I thought, God, you should have killed me the way I preached that sermon that way. You should have struck me dead. Um, but can I just tell you, though, that's the grace and mercy of God, that despite us, he would still use an imperfect people. And so, long story short, 2013 began a transformation in my life to say, you know what, I don't want to just pr prepare for Sunday, I want the Lord to prepare me for Sunday. And so that's really where the Word became alive in my life. And so we started, man, a reading plan here at Harmony. We're very simplistic. We have a reading plan that we walk through five days a week. Our life groups are based out of that reading plan. I preach Wednesday night and Sunday morning out of that reading plan. And the reason is because I know the Word of God. When it gets in you, oh man, there's some trans transformation that takes place in the life of people and it's no longer us just going through the motion checklisting checklisting boxes I mean I went to this I studied my Sunday school lesson I, I went to church I, I did this and I did this no it becomes who we are it becomes our life and here's why because the word is alive and active amen and I'll never forget that man the word became my joy 
my joy. And so literally from September 2013 to the day, I can't tell you how many days that I have missed reading God's Word, but it's not many, not many at all. And I don't want to read the Bible to finish it. I want to read the Bible to what? I want to read the Bible to change. And whenever I'm not allowing the Word of God to change my life daily through His Word, y'all, I find myself in great distress and despair. I'm just going to be honest with you. I feel like I have missed something and my joy becomes hindered. It really does. Man, John chapter 1 tells us, literally, I think, why our joy becomes one of despair and distress because of the lack of the Word. And what is the Word? And what does the Word desi desire to do? And what does the Word want to do today? Who is the Word? How did we get this Word? And so this morning, we're going to dive into that this morning if we can. And so if you have your Bible, John chapter 1, um, would you stand with me this morning for the reading and honoring of God's Word? Um, I've never preached this passage. In 15 years of preaching, I've never preached 1, 1 through 18. And um, I thought, my, my. Here we go. <clears throat> the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, I've preached that, and you've heard it, and we've talked about that a whole lot. Just the picture of the triune God from the beginning, made known through the Word, We'll talk about in a moment Jesus Christ. He says in verse 2, he was, in, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We talked about this this morning in our life group. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, has come into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Verse 12 says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of of God, who were born not of blood, nor for the will, of, nor, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And let's just stop right there, real quick. Do you understand? Right now, in this moment, it's not an accident or a mistake that you're even here in this building. Man, God, a holy God, breathed life into you, into existence into you, and it is not for your own. It's for Him and for His glory. And so, you even being here. This morning is a representation and display that God has a great plan and a purpose for your life. You ever thought about that? It's him. He did it. It's not an accident. It says this in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory as, the, as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out. This was he of whom I said. He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word. God, would you speak this morning for your glory. Father for, Father, for a heart here that's hard, Father, break it for one broken. By your mercy and grace, mend it. And Lord, I ask it in the mighty name of King Jesus. Speak, Lord, we ask. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Everybody smile. Y'all good? Everybody good? All right, here we go. Let me just go ahead and say why you need to smile straight off the bat. We say at Harmony, if Jesus is the master teacher, I need to be the master teacher. I need to be the master student. Well, let me just go ahead and let you know, students, this morning, um, I would ask you to take some notes, if you will. We have 12 truths this morning, 12 truths, not A and B, no sub truths. We just got 12 truths that we're going to dive into this morning. It's an amazing passage of Scripture. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Man, the first verses of the Gospel of John contain in what we believe as evangelical three basic affirmations that are fundamental to Christian theology, the study of God. And it's surrounded by a Greek word that we know as logos. Logos is an interesting word. It says, in the beginning was the word. And if you look in your Bible, it's a big W, right? It's a big W. And most of the time, whenever you find a capitalized letter, it's not in representation of a of a thing it's in representation of a person or a place and here in this moment John ran references the word as a person and this is interesting because he's literally one of the only gospels that does it because logos in the Greek is translated word speech principle or thought now this is interesting why why would it be those things word speech principle or thought well, Greek mythology used the word logos as a way that they would speak intellectually and it would get in a person. And so if you know anything about like Greek mythology, it was all about, man, the thought. It was all about the principle. It was all about the substance in which one would speak and would be received. But John looks at this moment totally different. It's not from a universal perspective as far as Greek mythology. It's from from a divine reasoning a divine reasoning and literally John says this is the mind of God the heart of God and this is who God is and so John uses the word our logos in reference only to one and that would be friend Jesus Christ it'd be Jesus Christ in the beginning was the logos the word capital W and here's why it says in the beginning was Jesus and Jesus was with God and Jesus was God now I'm not going to spend time on this this morning I don't have this type of time because it could literally turn in to a conference where we would spend hours in this but here's the truth y'all this passage separates Christianity from every other religion every other religion for most would say that Jesus is a good man Jesus is a, is a prophet. Man, he was a preacher. He was a teacher. But no, God himself, through the inspiration of John, says, no, Jesus is God. And we, here we find just this picture of the Trinity, of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Man, one identity co-equals in a divine revelation to reveal to you and I, humanity, who is God? Who is God? What does God desire to do? And what does he want to do in and through us? And so let's look at a few truths this morning. Truth number one. I'm going to preference it this way, the word. We're going to look at the logos. And so whenever you see the word, I want you to think in your mind, Jesus. Jesus. That's what John does. The word, Jesus. And so let's look at it from that perspective this morning. The Word has always been and will always be. Well, what do you mean by that, Brother Jay? Well, literally, John says, Jesus, the Word, is eternal. He just didn't come to give his life to offer those, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever will believe in him may have life and have it everlasting or eternal. He just didn't come to give his life for you and I to have eternal life he is eternal. The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus Christ. Before there was a beginning, He was. The Word, Jesus, had been a co-equal with God throughout all eternity. We're going to get there in a minute. Even the picture in Genesis, from the beginning, man, we find out that you and I, humanity was created in their image. In their image. Who is their image? It's this picture of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Man, the three in one, the triune God. And the Word has always been and will always be. Truth number two. The Word is from God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with 
God. The word is from God. That's literally what that means. This word is from God. And that's interesting because even whenever we read it in this translation, like the word was with God, here's what that means about the word. That this word, Jesus, had a face-to-face relationship with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Y'all, that's great news, by the way. Amen? I mean, a face-to-face relationship. And through this word, we're going to find out in a moment as well, John John 14. Man, John 14 paints this picture that those that come to know the way, the truth, and the life, that it's only through him that has made a way to God the Father. They have a personal relationship with one another, and it's displayed through the bodily man known as Jesus. Here's why that matters to you and I. It means that Jesus is relationally personal in his character. He can be easily approached, friend. Aren't you thankful for that? Man, he can be approached. He's personal in his character. Truth number three, the word is God. Now, it's interesting. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. This separates everything between Christianity and every other religion. Here's what Christ says even of himself Jesus is Lord Jesus is God and so in this moment the word was made known the word was made known the word was made known through Jesus Christ God was made known through Jesus Christ he says in John chapter 1 verse 14 and the word became flesh and dwelt among us God made himself known through Jesus the Son, the Word. He was literally, man, created in flesh, dwelt among us. And the Bible says that we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father. Like he has given us himself through his Son that we would know him. We would know him. Verse 18, no one has ever seen God, the only God. This is interesting because Here you have a parenthesis, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now this is interesting, when I read this, no one has ever seen God, the only God. Well, literally in translation, because Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God, that could also be translated, he is the only Son, the one and only Son. But who is he also known as? God. It's who he's known as, it's who he is, the Word is God. Why would you say that? Who is at the Father's side, personal in relationship? Friend, the Word has always been and will always be. The Word is from God and the Word is God. We could spend hours going through systematic theology studying just that one verse. But I want to move forward. Here's what I would love for you to do. GotQuestions.org. If you want to read about the Trinity, if you want to read about John 1, if you want to read about Logos, I would encourage you, gotquestions.org. Great website. It's in your Harmony Reading Plan on free resources. You can go read that. Bibleproject.com. Go study. Go watch an interaction of Logos or the Trinity. And they, I promise you, could help you a whole lot better than I could even in the hours that it would take. Truth number four. It's interesting because here in this moment, I didn't pick this up until this morning as I got up and woke up and continued to study. Here in this moment, it's like, this is who the Word is. Oh, yeah, and by the way, this is what the Word has done. The Word spoke creation into existence. The Bible says in verse 3, all things were made through Him. All things were made through him. Now this is interesting because Genesis 1, John 1, they they literally go hand in hand. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Six days, God created. Guess what he also created in those six days? He created you and I. Amen? Like the Bible says, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God Almighty created man and woman in his perfect image, what he desired to literally man, be his representation to the world, to the world. And so we were made, created through him. The Bible would say in Colossians chapter 1, Paul would tell the church of Colossae in verse 16 and 17, for by him all things were created. 
Jesus in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This Jesus. And he's still holding it together, friend. Amen. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in the last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed the heirs of all things. Through him also he created the world. Man, here's just this picture. They're making it known. Like, this is the word. This is Jesus. This is what he has done. And he has been a part of speaking all things into existence. Through him also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Friend, this is huge. This is huge. Why would you say this is huge? Can I just tell you? This is huge because creation itself is a foundational doctrine of the Christian faith. Creation. What do you mean by that, Brother Jonathan? Here's what I mean by that. You you, you need to hear this. This would be for our good this morning. What I mean by that is, do you realize that scientists, man, people with agendas, they have from the beginning tried to disprove That God created everything. And if they could disprove that God created the heavens and the earth, all of creation, you and I, then they can disprove the rest of the Bible. Guess what they've never been able to do? They've never been able to prove that the world was a big bang. They've never been able to prove that the world just evolved. They've never been able to prove that the world just morphs and forms into different things. They've never been able to prove it. And they've never been able to disprove that God created the heavens and the earth. Because if they could disprove Genesis 1, then the whole Bible falls apart. Guess what has never fallen apart, friend? God's Word. It's still foundational truth forever. Truth number five. The Word is the giver of life. So notice what happens. This is who He is. Now He speaks creation into existence. Truth number five. The Word is the giver of life. Look at verse four. In Him was life. Amen. Somebody say amen to that. Like, in Him is life. Here's what He's saying. Jesus is the source of life. This is who Jesus is. If you want to know life, and you want to know life eternally, then Jesus is the source of that life. He is the one who gives life eternally for all who would believe upon his name. Truth number six. Somebody say amen. Y'all, I've been preaching 35 minutes. I've been watching it. Excuse me, excuse me, 15 minutes. I've been watching it. I'm already on truth number six, Steve. Amen. Glory to God. All right, here we go. The word produces evidence. I just want to see if anybody grinned on that one. Look at this, friend. The Word is the giver of life, Jesus. He is the one who gives life. And it is Jesus who produces the evidence of life. If you want to look at a person and know if they have Jesus, just look at the evidence of light that comes from Christ in their life. Verse number 4, in Him was life. He is the life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 4, verse 5, the light shines in darkness. It's the evidence of the word in a life. We sing it a lot of times. Shine, Jesus, shine, right? You look at this picture like Jesus is in us. He's shining in and through us. It is him as evidence in our life. Why why is this important? Because as we look at the evidence, we look at light, this is who he is. David even picked up on it in the Old Testament. Whenever he would say in Psalms 119, 105, Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. Well, guess who is the lamp into my feet? 
It's not just this word. It's the Jesus of this word. Amen. It's who he is. He is the lamp into my feet. He is the light to my path. Why? Because the Bible says he is the determiner of my path. He is the one who plans his ways. Man determines his step, but it is the Lord who has planned and prepared his way. In other words, God is sovereign in all that he does. He is the one who breathes life. He is the one who takes life. And if you're in him, he is the one who gives life eternally. And friend, there's great evidence if you know him or not. It's who he is. Matthew chapter 5, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would say to a people, you are the light of the world. You are the evidence of the life giver. It is who you are, and it comes through me. I'm the one who produces the evidence. Friend, here's the problem with a lot of churches, a lot of us, a lot of people that call themselves Christians. We are the ones that want to produce the evidence in our life based off of the things we know, the people that we're a part of, the church that we belong to, and our past things that we've done. We want our evidence to be based off of us. Can I tell you, it is extremely evident as well, whether if it's in and through Christ or if it's in and through yourself. Because he says, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden, Matthew 5, 14. Verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven anybody want to sing this little light of mine like I'm, I'm feeling it this morning right and I remember this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine and hide it under a bushel no I want to let it shine why friend because Jesus Christ the giver of the life giver of life the one who presents great evidence in and through others is true light verse 9 chapter 1 the Bible says the true light which gives light to everyone, has come into the world. And there should be evidence. Truth number seven, the word will never be overcome. Somebody say amen. The word will never be overcome. The Bible says the darkness has not overcome it. Verse five, light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome. It. Not even darkness itself can overcome the word. Matter of fact, it is darkness that highlights the word. It was darkness on the day of Calvary when Jesus Christ would give his life for all of humanity that made evidently known that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God. That he was the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world that we talked about, man, this morning in a life group. It was in the midst of darkness where it seemed like all hope was gone. Whenever we find out three days later after Jesus Christ died on a cross, he was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose again to defeat death, hell, and the grave. That those would put their faith in him, believe upon his name, that he would give them life eternally, eternally and abundantly. Man, the word will never be overcome, not even in the midst of your dark world nor mine. It is the word that continues to give life, and it is the word that continues to make it evidently known in your life who you belong to. The Bible says, Isaiah 48, which also First Peter um, picks, or Peter picks it up also in First Peter, the grass withers, the flower, flowers fade, but it is the word of our God that will stand Forever is the word. Friend, if this word right here stands forever, but the, white flower, the flowers wither and the grass fades, why don't I want to spend more time in the garden than this right here? Why don't I want to spend more time viewing the things of creation instead of the creator himself? Is this word right here that does not fail, that is not empty and will not return void and can never be overcome truth number eight the word is truth and sanctifies us in truth so what do you mean by that brother jay well it's interesting because notice the character of the word in this moment the bible says in verse nine again he is the true light he is the true light in verse 14, the Bible says, And the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. We have seen His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father, full of grace 
and truth. He is truth, full of truth, which means he is all truth, which means it is absolute truth. It's absolute truth. Now, now before I even go any further, I just feel impressed to say this. I was on a plane not long ago. Jude and I, we headed to Colorado. We were going to a camp there, and I sat by this guy. This guy was extremely interesting. We had left Atlanta, flew into somewhere, Kansas City, I think. We let people off a plane, people get on a plane, and we were going to pick back up and head to Colorado. And so this guy, he gets on, he, he looked like the lead singer for like Limp Biscuit or something. I mean, he was tall, skinny, big glasses, thick, man, kind of bald, um, shorts, cargo shorts, like big cargo shorts, and he he had little like loafers on and had colorful socks, like real colorful socks. And, and I thought, man, I've got a whole lot to talk about right now with this guy. And so he sits down and he has this book. And I have a book and I'm just waiting for the opportunity. And I have my book. He has this book. And he'd open his book and he had a pen. Well, I had a pen. I marked through my books. I marked through my body. I marked through everything. And so I'm sitting there and I'm looking for an opportunity. He opens up his book and he'll read it. He'll circle something and do like this, and he'll just look around. And I went, hey, man, what you reading? He looked at it and folded it, and he went like that. And I said, oh, that's Ernest Hemingway, man. That's old school, man. What do you like about Hemingway? And we got to talking about Ernest Hemingway and his books and his writings. And I said, well, well that, that, that's interesting. Um, he looked at me, and I said, well, here's what I'm reading. And it was a David Platt book, and I was reading it, and we got to talking, and I said, what do you do? He said, oh, I love music. Uh, he said, I live in Montana. I'm, I'm part of the music industry. He said, basically what I do is, is I, I man, wire places for concerts. I do mixing and stuff like that. And I said, oh, that's cool. I said, well, I play. I said, you play in a band? He said, yeah, I'm a drummer in a band. I said, well, I play. My son plays. We both play guitar, and, and we, we like playing and singing. That's pretty cool. I said, man, who's your favorite band? He said, oh, well, my my." favorite bands red hot chili peppers i said you ever seen them live he's like yeah i saw them live a few weeks ago i was like oh man that's cool well if you didn't didn't know like i'm not promoting music but flea part of red hot chili peppers is man come out that he has put his faith and trust in christ huh interesting and so i'm going like ding oh we got something to talk about now and so i i asked him i said hey man do you have any spiritual beliefs and he went nah not really. And he said this, parents. He said, I grew up in church. I said, what happened? You left? And I said, why did, why did you leave? He said, well, he said, I, man, just be honest with you. I never saw anybody living out what they were claiming to believe. And I went, yes, sir. Hear that all the time. I said, well, let me ask you. If you grew up in church and you know a little bit, who is Jesus to you? He went, man, I really don't know. I'm trying to figure it out. And here's what he said. He said, man, I guess I'm one of those people that, man, as long as you find your truth, that it's okay. As long as you find your truth. And I said, man, I struggle with that. He said, why do you struggle with that? I said, well, here's why. Because if you claim your truth is truth and I claim my truth is truth, then what we're both saying is our truth is subjective. And if it's subjective truth, is it really truth to begin with? Why is that big to you and I? Because the world has put a belief in subjective truth. And there is only one who has given absolute truth, friend, and his name is Jesus. You can't deny it. You can't run from it. You may question it, have doubts about it, even may not believe it. And that's your subjective truth. But here's the reality. He is absolute truth. And so I began to tell him, if you look at this moment and you see the word is truth, the Lord is truth, and he sanctifies us in truth, and you can't overcome it ever, here's where I told this guy. I don't know why the Lord's leading me to tell you this this morning other than he just impressed on my heart I needed to do it. All right? Here, here's the reality. So here's what I told him. I said, man, I said, can I tell you about this word? I said, here's the reality. This word has changed my life. Nobody else, this word has radically changed my life. I said, I don't believe this is subjective truth, and you can't even present it as subjective truth. Here's why I know it's truth. 
because this word is 66 books written by over 40 different authors spread over 1500 years in three different continents in three different languages and I said brother there's only one way that this play, that, that this thing right here can continue to hold as true that it can't be refuted it can't be denied you can't do it it's only one reason that it can because it is absolute truth and the guy looks at me and he goes how many books? 66. How many authors? 44. How many years you said? 1,500. In three different continents and three different languages. And he went, huh. Huh. I said, not only that, but if you read Fox News this week, they have found an additional place that they began to dig they found additional artifacts, and now, this week, while we were on the plane, I said, and now there is over 5,000, Doc, 5,000 manuscripts that they have found, that they believe to be either, either original or second century original, and every single one of them have done nothing but highlighted the truth of this word. Every one of them. Friend, I've been around the world. I've been in more museums than you can imagine. And every one of them that has any type of artifact always points the truth and the validity and the absolute truth of God's word. Friend, the word is truth. And if this word is truth, then he sanctifies us in his truth. This is Jesus this is God breathed, profitable for correcting, teaching, rebuking, training that you and I, the righteous person that dwells their life in this word, may be thoroughly equipped for the work, the purpose in which God has given us. The Bible says in John 17, 17, Lord, sanctify, sanctify them in your truth. Your word, interesting, John 17, your word, literally translated logos is truth jesus is truth and jesus would say john 14 6 i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me truth number nine the word reveals his grace the bible says in verse 14 and the word became flesh dwelt among us we have seen his glory glory as the only son from the father full of grace can i just say this friend this is simply god's character this is who he is. It's who Jesus is. We just finished, man, reading through the Old Testament. Do you realize that every Old Testament book that we read through, minus two, minus two of them, I was keeping track, by the way, reveals God's character. And it is the same from Genesis to Malachi. This is God's character. The Bible says that he is gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. That's who he is. That is God's character. And being that this is Jesus' character as well, it's, non, it's unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is a God of grace. It is who he is. And Jesus just simply reveals the grace of his daddy, of God the Father. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. The Bible says, far by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. It is simply grace. Somebody say grace. Oh, God's grace. Man, it is grace that a holy God would send himself to dwell in human flesh, to give his life for all peoples, that those would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their heart that God raised him from the dead would be saved. Which means that God would display his mercy and his grace to a somebody like me. That God would take the Calvary cross what I deserve, mercy. And give me what I don't deserve, grace. Wow. And Jesus reveals it. Truth number 10, the word must be received and believed. If this is who he is, if this is what he has done, if this is his character, then the word must be received and believed. Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. 
Friend, the only way that I can become a child of God is in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. This perfect word who is truth and sanctifies us in his truth. And the Bible says in verse 12, to those who did receive him. In other words, that word receive means that they took it willingly. Right? Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for it is by grace that you are saved through faith. It's not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. This picture in first in, in, in John chapter 1, verse 12 then is like, there's this gift, and I must take it willingly. I receive it. I take the gift of Jesus Christ. In other words, the Bible says in Romans chapter 10 that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved because it's with the heart that one believes resulting in righteousness. It's with the mouth that one confesses resulting in salvation. And that picture of receiving is literally a picture of confessing. I'm confessing that I have the gift. I hold the gift. I received the gift. I took it willingly. And he says, and believed upon him who believed in his name, who believed in his name. Well, that word belief is the same belief in John 3. It is the word that we find in the Greek, pastuo, to have faith in, to entrust in. And I've always used the analogy of pastuo, that if I believe that Jesus is Lord, then I'm going to lay before him. I'm going to lay down. I'm holding on, and I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. Regardless if I'm on the mountaintop or from the valley low, I'm not letting go. Me and a preacher friend of mine, we were talking this week, and I said, man, how, how do you... How do you give the word pastuo like how do you help people understand the word pastuo and he said well I always just still use the old Billy Graham analogy and you'd say well what's the Billy Graham analogy of pastuo well I'm glad you asked so Billy Graham always used the word for belief pastuo and he would give an example of this way he said you know I I used to watch people on tight ropes and he said I'll never forget that um, I was watching this guy, and he was tightrope, and he was going to go across the Grand Canyon. Right? We've all seen crazy stuff like that. Y'all remember, y'all remember they used to put that on prime time on NBC back in the day, right? Um, they'd put it on there, and they'd watch Evil Knievel jump ramps. Y'all remember when they do that? Some, y'all don't even have a clue what I'm talking about, do you? Did y'all see them? They all shook their head. Evil who? Um, y'all, y'all remember? Anybody remember that? Come on, man. So, man, I remember, man, NBC, they had put this... Man, big promo, Evil Knievel's going to jump this, man. And I'd be like, oh, granddaddy, can we please watch Evil Knievel? He's going to jump it, man. He's got his heart. He's got his body. He's ready to go, wow. You know, I'm ready to watch Evil Knievel. And so anyway, so then they began to start putting all these extreme sports on. They put tightrope artists on. Remember? I remember, y'all remember the one that went across the Niagara Falls? And it was like, man, I'm telling you, NBC did it up right. They portrayed this dude as already dead before it even came on, right? Just water splashing everywhere and misting. Well, here's what Billy Graham said. He said, it's interesting that you can see a tightrope artist, man, walking up walking across a tightrope, 178 feet above air, man, pushing a wheelbarrow. And you can believe that he'd do it. You can believe that he'll do it. He said, but that's not true belief. Billy Graham would say, true belief is getting in the wheelbarrow and letting him push you across. That's pastuo. See, a lot of us think intellectually, oh, I believe he can do it. Well, how much do you believe he can do it? Do you believe it so much that you get in the wheelbarrow and let him push you across? See, that's what Jesus calls belief. Get in the wheelbarrow and let me push. And here's what John says. To those who receive him, take willingly and get in the wheelbarrow. It is that person who can proclaim they are a child of God. Not before, but then. Truth number 11. The word is to proclaim by those who have received and believed. And this is the evidence, by the way, friend. So the Bible says that there was a man, verse 6, sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. So here's one who received, who had believed. And what is he now doing? He is proclaiming to the world. He's proclaiming. Man, here's the one who gives light into darkness, who, man, rescues people from death to life, from lost to found, from Sinner to saint. And he says, he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. It's what he did. Verse 23 would go so far where he would say, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. 
Make straight the way of the Lord, proclaiming the gospel. In other words, he was a witness bearer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And can I tell you, if you have received willingly the gospel, believed in your heart, got in the wheelbarrow and not getting out, then you and I have a commandment, an obligation to proclaim with everything we have as witness bearers that this Jesus is Lord. Amen. Maybe it's just me. It's who we are. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, again, he would say this in verse 1, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word that I preached to you, unless you believed it in vain, you got out of the wheelbarrow. For I deliver to you as first importance that I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. I love 1 Corinthians 15. Here's Paul saying, this is the most important thing you will ever hear. It's the most important thing you will ever believe. And it's the most important thing that you will ever speak. The gospel of Jesus Christ. The word of God. Truth number 12. Y'all ready? The word has changed my life. Amen. Friend, this word has changed my life. I'm not the same. And I'm not the same because I'm your pastor. I'm not the same because I live in Kapai County. I'm not the same because my family, man, owns and operates Six Mile. And, man, we've had opportunity and you grace us with the opportunity to minister over 550 people this summer man that's not what my life has changed can I tell you my life began to change July the 24th 2002 as a 21 year old boy when I believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and I willingly received him and it was by his grace and his grace alone that my life began to radically change September 2013 Ten years ago, whenever I desired this word to be living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, and I made a commitment that day in Branson, Missouri, that I would allow the word of God to speak and breathe in and through my life the best that I knew how to be changed by him, that I would live my life out of the overflow of what the Holy Spirit of God would do in and through his word, that I would look, Lord, how can I apply this great truth? How can I apply it? And can I tell you, man, ministering, preaching the gospel, preaching in truth, John 17, 17, changed the way I preach forever. And I love it. And I tell it everywhere I go. And I had a guy this week, he's a youth minister at Pike County. He sent me this, Dusty. It was Cade, by the way. Cade sent me, he said, Hey, Brother Jay, can I tell you, I started preaching in truths, and it changed the way I preached. I went, that a boy, that a boy. Your word is truth. Sanctify us. In other words, make us holy in your truth. And friend, here's what I believe the Lord desires to do in you and I today. To make the word become our life. Jesus to become our life to be the evidence of our life radically transform our life in a way that we would just simply proclaim the life that we have is not through us but it's through him can I ask you a question this morning has the word the logos the Christ has he changed your life